So we're going to be talking about water diversion today, and um, I just wanted to lay some groundwork for you. So humans have been holding water, diverting water, moving water for as long as they've been human beings. So um, as long as we could figure out that we had the capacity to do this, we have been doing it. Now this has um, consequences, of course. Uh, some are positive and some are not so great. So we're going to go through these um, today. All right. Yeah, p pardon my pun. Okay, so once again, we go back to the watershed. Now, this is your typical, prototypical watershed right here. Um, you'll notice that we have the uh, mountains, which, as I've said before, uh, a watershed doesn't have to have mountains for it to get started, but that is one of the most common ways for that to occur. Now, this particular watershed, you'll notice that there's a quote up here about human settlements. Um, primarily, humans have been settling near water for as long as we've been having water. What do we use it for? We use it for transportation. We use it for food. Um, obviously, we're creatures who need a lot of water, so we're near it. In this particular one, you'll notice that the, the watershed um, includes places that have a floodplain to them um, and crops being grown. So um, that's definitely part of it. Um, there's also a settlement or a city that's close to the river up here. Now, um, you'll notice also there's a dam down here at the bottom, and um, it moves on down into wetlands, and then finally onto the coastlines. Um, why do we settle on coastlines? Well, we've used transportation, obviously the oceans and so forth, but also food. Um, along those coastlines, we've been eating seafood, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of, cultures out there that still are really heavily dependent upon um, fish and other things from the sea. Now, along coastlines, you're going to find a lot of productivity, and so that means that a lot of food is available on coastlines. But it also puts us in vulnerable positions, of course. Um, as we've cleared out the wetlands and cleared out the um, the marshes and so forth, we found that it actually puts us in more harm than, um, than so forth. But as we move upward, we can um, see some good that can come from this. All right, let's move on. How do we control water? Here's some various ways. Dams. So there's the old Hoover Dam right there. Um, also the dam that dams up Lake Powell, which I never can remember the name of. Um, a canal. So what you'll notice that a canal channels water through and some famous cities, of course, Venice and Bruges and Amsterdam all sit on canals that were constructed. So they use them as transportation to get around the city. Um, and also is just a way to keep water from flowing and be able to build next to the water. Um, a levee, which is the one over here on the right-hand side, a levee is a little bit different. So a levee is designed to keep water out of an area, right? So it traps the water and keeps it held so that it doesn't spill down. And so you could clear out land on the other side of the levee. Um, levees also can channel water as well. Most of them are earthen, so what that means is that they use um, they use soil to hold it in place rather than any sort of material construction. Um, the a dike is also a form of a levee, so a dike is meant to hold seawater out as well. Okay, pipes, one in the middle. So we can do underground pipes, overground pipes, whatever it takes to move water from one place to another. Uh, wells go into the ground and pull water up from the bottom. Um, almost every water system uh, has an underground component to it. And um, we know that rocks and soil hold water in quite well. Um, an aqueduct, so that's there on the right-hand side. An aqueduct's... Um, are above ground. Um, the Romans were famous for their aqueduct construction, but they're not the only ones. There's lots of aqueducts where the water runs across a constructed um, structure. So Dallas even has one called the viaduct, which is also a form of an aqueduct. And then, of course, a reservoir is a way in which we reserve or hold water uh, behind usually damming up an area. Okay, 
let's move on. And you'll, I, I do want to point out this little picture right here shows you how you take a canyon area and then it fills it up, which is also what happened up here with Hoover Dam as well and Lake Mead. Why do we do this? Well, mostly we are trying to get water from where we don't have it to water where we or from water where we have it to water where we don't have it. So water rich to water poor. The other thing is that um, these uh, water channels help us to take advantage of rainwater. So in Texas, we are either water starved or water overload, right? So we either have periods of flooding or we have periods of drought. And so what this does is it allows us to take rainfall and capture it before it runs on off into the sea. Um, and that's why the state of Texas has so many reservoirs is because we don't have any natural way of holding in water. So this is, allows us to do this. Um, the reservoirs also are the, the damming also protect, protects us against flooding. So Dallas and Fort Worth both have in their history, historic floods. Um, and so one of the reasons why Lake Louisville was constructed was to, to stop the flow through downtown Dallas so that it didn't flood anymore. Um, it, there's some really interesting history about Dallas, Fort Worth, both, and their flooding um, and then the other thing is it just allows us to use water in ways that we haven't before. So it increases our ability to settle inland more than on coastlines or on rivers, um, to be able to take places that are very dry and turn them into livable areas. So all of the desert cities, for example, those, those all are, um, places where they would not be possible for humans to live in great numbers were it not for controlling the water. All right, but of course, every time we do something uh, that benefits us, we end up with environmental issues. Um, poor water management simply means that if we don't uh, manage it properly, we're going to run into problems. Um, and uh, so one of the things that can happen is displacement of people. Louisville, the lake, the lake at Louisville, um, and this also goes along with the next one, the productive land. So where that sits currently used to be an old dairy farm. Um, there also a, there was a mill up there, and there was a settlement. It was an African American settlement um, right there at the, where the dam sits. Um, they told those people that they had six years. They said, yeah, it's not going to flood. It's not going to fill up with water for about six years. So you got time. Turns out they didn't have time. It filled up because we had an enormous rain rainfall that year. And within two months, the lake was completely full. Those people didn't have time to even hardly put their, their underwear in the box and get out of town. I mean, it was done. So... Um, this, this is a problem. Uh, once again, when we talk about um, how this affects people, people of color um, are disparately hurt by things like this. So it's an environmental justice issue. Also, uh, what they have to do if they want to build something like a dam is they have to declare eminent domain. If you don't know anything about eminent domain, you need to hear this. So eminent Eminent domain is where um, a city entity, a state or whatever can declare, any government entity can declare that they want a particular area for the greater good. So a hospital, for example, a dam, which would benefit a lots of people. However, the people who are living there don't necessarily want to move, right? It wasn't their choice. So what they do with eminent domain is they come in, they declare, they will tell people, we're going to give you full market value or market value for your property. And it's usually not uh, what they would ordinarily expect to get. Also, those areas, they, um, they usually uh, are people who, you know, are kind of, they, they, they own their property. They don't want to leave. But now a government's coming in and telling them that you, you have to clear out. So they, they're, if there is resistance, what happens next is that the government entity will come in and basically offer them a dollar. 
and declare the property condemned, which means that no one can live there because it is now condemned, and they take the property. They seize the property. So eminent domain is not a very popular decision uh, by a lot of people, but the justification is that this is going to help more people than just those individuals who live there. All right, moving on with environmental uh, issues. Obviously, um, this can destroy natural habitats if you're slowing water flow down or if you're covering over with water. Um, those kinds of things can happen, which then, of course, leads to a lack of biodiversity. Um, and so those always go hand in hand. Aquifers. So underground water, the groundwater, um, is getting more and more depleted, especially in our need for agriculture. So uh, we're looking at how do we how do we do this without drawing on our aquifers so hard? Um, and this is a problem. And of course, lake depletion can also be there. Finally, um, when you stop the flow of water, a natural flow of water, you're going to lose your estuaries down in the deltas. So um, the vital nutrients that would come down with water flow are now being stopped. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about Miss uh, Louisiana here in just a minute. All right. Um, several well-known, and these are always, um, these are like AP favorites. They love to talk about a couple of these. The first one is the Colorado River Basin. So the Colorado River flows from the Rocky Mountains westward, um, and it is through snowmelt. So um, it runs through deserts, and then it ends up in um, a couple of really hot places. So Lake Powell and Lake Mead, because remember you have the mountains, and then you have that dry air coming across from the west into the desert regions. So the Colorado River flows through there, formed the Grand Canyon. So it's been powerful over the years. Um, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Unfortunately, Lake Mead is being drawn through so quickly, not just by Las Vegas, but also by Phoenix as well, that these rivers, this Colorado River Basin and the tributaries that feed into it um, are really being taxed. So that by the time it gets to Mexico, it's virtually dry. So you can imagine that that is not cool, right? So there's a governmental entity that that oversees the Colorado River Basin. In fact, it's regional. And they all have a, a, a hand in how the decisions are made for that river flow. Climate change is affecting the Colorado River. So... As the snow, like they just got a huge snow dump, right? But it came late in the season. And what this means is that it's going to melt rapidly. So as temperatures increase in those areas because of climate change, the water um, is going, the snow is going to melt a lot more rapidly, which is going to cause immediate flooding, all right? So that you're getting an upper flooding. But then when they, when they were counting on a slow, a slow melt, right, and the water moving at a steady pace, all of a sudden you get flooding and then you get nothing, right? So there's a lot of concern about this. And so why do people care? They care because they can see the effects of climate change coming on them. Okay, so there's just, that's Hoover Dam. Um, the next one is the Aral Sea. So the Aral Sea uh, sits right here between uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and they both are water rich, now, both of these areas are this whole area in here is um, used for agriculture, primarily the growing of wheat. Um, and so the Aral Sea has been used as a, um, an irrigation um, source. So what has happened with the Aral Sea? Well, what you're seeing, and y'all probably remember this from World Geo, but um, if you look at the, the maps that you have here, so from 1977, and by the way, this is like a historical picture right here. Um, this was what the Oral Sea looked like and what the riverbed or the lake bed itself looks like, but it doesn't look that way anymore. So as it has been continued to be used, you see that the water has left it very depleted. So from 1977 to 1989, you can see the water loss and the water depth loss to 2006. Pay attention. So 
So here is 76. There's what it, the historic levels look like. There's what it looked like in 97, 2007. So you can see that the easternmost lobe is almost completely dried up. Um, 2010, 14 and 15. Now, what this has also left is you'll notice it's left a lot of this deposit that's down in here, right? All of that white stuff is wind blowing across. So now it's, it's turned desert-like, right? So the wind is now coming across that area, and anything that was left, any deposits that were left behind are now subject to blowing across. So old pesticides, old, um, old fertilizers, um, all kinds of minerals and uh, industrial compounds that were underneath the water are now being exposed. And people who are living in this area are suffering from all kinds of maladies and illnesses because of this. Okay, there's a, a little shot of the Aral Sea right there. So as we, um, as we grow in population and we find our climates getting warmer and warmer and more and more evaporation, we're putting more and more pressure on our water systems and our water resources. And what this has led to is more dams. Well, that makes sense, right? You just die, dam up more water. Um, but this changes the water flow um, down below. And so now we're, you know, we're faced with uh, more and more problems as we go. Creating more reservoirs. Um, Dallas County is in currently in the middle of building another huge one in the northeast part of, of Texas. Um, and it's taking up lots and lots of farmland. Um, going deeper in wells, so being able to um, just try to reach the um, the reservoirs that are uh, up underneath um, is getting, or the not the reservoirs, but the aquifers that are up underneath, um, it's getting more and more expensive expensive to drill down that far. Now nature pours a vacuum, so that means that if you have an area that's got water contained in it and holding land above it, if you pull that water out, the land is going to collapse on top of itself. Um, this creates sinkholes. Um, it also, you know, is a, a land destroyer. So um, really, really dangerous stuff. And, um, and it, this happens also with our gas wells as well. Um, and then finally, looking for water in more remote places. Like, how do we capture things like icebergs? Is that a possibility, right? Being able to find ways to use water that, that's in a, a place where humans don't necessarily go to live. All right. And this also has a political component to it, as you can imagine. So the Middle East has always had a problem, and it all, almost always centers around the fight over water. The Nile, the Jordan, the Tigris, Euphrates, all of those are vying for the same limited resource, which is water. Um, the, the droughts um, only make this worse. And what will happen then is you have one political entity holding, um, holding the other one kind of hostage, so Sudan suffered from a famine, and a lot of that was over fights on water. S um, Syria is another instance where water becomes then the basically the component. An interesting thing about this is that Israel has um, some really robust um, desalinization methods, and they've actually now been able to share their their desalinated water with their surrounding neighbors, which has helped to improve relationships in those areas. So it doesn't have to be all bad news, but for the most part, <laughs> it's bad news. All right, here's the Yangtze, a really beautiful river in China. Um, here is where it is. Now, the reason why the Yangtze is such a big thing with AP is because of the Three Gorges Dam. So here's the Yangtze running through the middle of China, and you'll notice it's a very, very long uh, river. The, the Yangtze has the Three Gorges Dam that's right here in the middle. Um, this is the largest, most massive dam ever built in the world. So what does it look like? Here's what it looks like. 
So you can see they, they use a lot for hydroelectricity, um, but it also controls the amount of water that flows uh, from one end of the river to another. But the majority of this is used for hydroelectric power. Um, this just shows you a little topography of what it looked like prior to the Three Gorges Dam and what it looks like now. So you can see the areas were flooded um, and they lost not only um, habitat, but they also lost some uh, historic and archaeological sites as well when that area was covered over. Excuse me. All right. When we talk about politics, let's just go back and look at something like the Colorado River Basin. So here it is flowing through the canyons. Um, and it actually um, plays a role in three hot cities, right? Dry cities. Phoenix, Las Vegas, and um, L.A. None of those cities should be as big as they actually are, except for maybe L.A. It could probably handle a little bit of it. But they all depend upon the Colorado River making its way across the western part of the United States. I saw this billboard, and I thought that was pretty awesome. It shows kind of the, the um, looking for water in more and more remote places. But the Great Lakes are their own thing. Like for us to try to build a pipeline from... <laughs> Illinois down to Texas seems a little ridiculous. Like, surely we can do better than that. Okay, so there are your three hot cities um, and the development. And like I said, if it wasn't for water diversion, Las Vegas and Phoenix probably wouldn't even exist as major cities. But what about in our own neighborhoods? So most of us live in neighborhoods that have grass that looks like this. This is called uh, St. Augustine, um, and here's the thing about St. Augustine. You'll notice, first of all, it is a monoculture, right? There's no, there's no other diversity growing up underneath it. It's also a shade-tolerant um, grass. It is not native, and it requires two things, lots of water and lots of fertilizer. Um, so we have to, inst we have to institute... Um, a lot of water restrictions because of the amount of water that goes on these lawns. Um, this one's bad. The one that's worse is, um, is Bermuda. So Bermuda grass is a kind of a grass. Um, it's also not native and it is a huge water suck and a huge fertilizer needer in order to keep it green. Uh, if I can do one thing in this class, I want you to hear me now and believe me later. We've got to get away from lawns. We just absolutely have to. They don't do anybody any good. They don't hold, they don't hold wildlife. They don't support anything except our need for seeing flat green. That's it. For whatever reason, this became a thing and we can't, get, we can't seem to get rid of it. Um, you, all of you have seen times when it was raining and someone had their sprinklers going. I saw during the snowstorm that we had um, sprinklers turning areas into ice storms, right? Uh, the other thing is people will leave them on and they'll just run down the street. Well, all that fertilizer that you applied and all those pesticides, they go down the street into the storm drain into our watershed. These are horrible, horrible things, and we have to break our, the stranglehold they have on us. If I can tell you anything environmentally and get it across to you, it's we have got to stop this kind of thing right here. we got to stop it. So what are our solutions? Okay, this is, a, this is something called xeriscaping. It's spelled X-E-R-I-S-C-A-P-I-N-G. Xeriscaping. And what it is is working with plants that are suitable to our area that don't require the watering. Once they get established, you don't have to do anything for them, but just let them be. Um, so some of you would look at that and say, it's got a lot of rock. I don't like that. You don't have to. 
There's other ways. I'm going to show you some more xeriscaping. Look at that. Look at all that color. Now you can still have lawn in here. You can still have a little bit of grass growing, but we need to start moving toward native grasses. The buffalo grass. Buffalo grass. It is a native short grass. It only grows six inches tall. Doesn't need to be mowed. It doesn't like fertilizer and it doesn't want water. It's drought tolerant. Also, the roots on these things are super long. Why is that an advantage? Because it holds in carbon. It's holding in all of that carbon. I'm, the Bermuda grass doesn't do anything. It's not, it's not meant to live here, and it's an invasive species, and we have to move away from it. What are we going to do? Well, you can plant a rock bed or a garden bed like that and then have a little bit of lawn. Unfortunately, a lot of our HOAs don't like this. They don't like this look. Um, and that is really up to us because those are, those are our own user, um, user governing bodies. Why can't we change that? Why can't we make something different? We owe it to ourselves and we owe it to our water to be able to sh make this shift. Okay, I'm moving on. Um, all right, so what are some dangers living near coastlines? Obviously, things like hurricanes, floods, monsoons, and so forth. And as long as we can preserve our coastlines, and this is something that we're moving away from trying to build on things that, should, that we've drained. Drain the swamp? No, we don't drain the swamp, y'all. We fill the swamp. We leave it alone. We let it work for us. We don't drain it. We don't pull up plants from the coastline because it ends up costing us more money in the long run. We need these things. All right. Um, another one here is the, um, this is the New Orleans area. So New Orleans, built right there at the delta of the Mississippi River. Um, also, it's at the bottom of Lake Pontchartrain which, and Lake Maripas, which is also a natural lake. It sits below sea level. It's in a bathtub. And in fact, there's a little town down here called Bathtub. But um, Louisiana is losing its foot, okay? So while you see the historic pictures of what Louisiana looks like, this area in here, this wetlands, is basically going underwater. Part of that is due to climate change, and the other part is due to our water diversion that we have conducted along the Mississippi River in order to keep it in a fixed spot we've actually had to maneuver and engineer for that to happen historically the the Mississippi River has had a wide berth it's had a wide floodplain and has been able to move in a wide area and that doesn't happen anymore um, this has caused some real issues and mainly because people live down there right so what happened with Hurricane Katrina was that they got overwhelmed with seawater and winds and so forth, and it caused a breach in the canals and the levee system. This would be Lake Pontchartrain up here. Um, and Lake Pontchartrain basically uh, broke through the levees and flooded parts of the city of New Orleans. Which parts? You got it where people of color live more than ever, right? So a lot of those places were extremely vulnerable to the breaches in these canals. And remember, a levee is earthen, meaning it, had, it was made with dirt, essentially. And so once the water started to over, over flood it, then it became an issue. There was so much finger pointing going on um, in New Orleans New Orleans and Louisiana pointed and said, the feds needed to do more to help us. The feds said, we sent you money and you didn't spend it right. Just lots and lots of fighting about it. And so um, they, they fixed a lot of the levee system, but it's still a really vulnerable place. Louisiana, New Orleans lost a lot of their population. They left and came to Texas, to the Houston area, and then got hit by Harvey. But they left, and they, they basically decreased the population of New Orleans, which may not be a bad thing. 
So here's kind of what it looked like once those levees broke and Lake Pontchartrain came into the city of New Orleans. And you can see here where the canal, this canal broke, and one side no water, the other side flooding. All right, so how have we made these worse? Well, the, we've talked a little bit about that. So that's it. Um, I hope this has been informative. I will tell you, AP loves to talk about the Oral Sea. They love to talk about the Salton Sea, which I think is in the textbook. Um, they like to talk about uh, the Colorado River Basin and the Yangtze because of the Three Gorges Dam. So there you have it. Hey, y'all. It's over. I'll see you later. Bye.